Hello, everybody. This is the midweek message from Messiah Lutheran Church in Mechanicsville, Virginia. My name is Pastor Ryan Radke, and I will be continuing uh, my series I've put together for the end of the summer on uh, the broad topic of Christian nationalism, and uh, particularly uh, talking about sort of the danger that poses, the uh, concerns that I have about that term being brought back into usage again, especially by some um, elected officials and other public representatives in our kind of society and culture uh, over the recent months. It's been around for a long time, but seems to be being brought back recently mm -hmm. in terms of uh, something to aspire towards, that we as a country should be a Christian nation, uh, that Christian nationalism is a good thing. It's a label we should apply to ourselves. Um, and some of the concerns I have come from our own history as a people, including that of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. And I have this book published in 1999 called Betrayal, German Churches and the Holocaust, edited by Robert P. Erickson and Susanna Heschel. And by reading this sort of historical survey of the German church, both Catholic and Protestant in Germany, uh, and the build-up to and during World War II, um, it's giving me some insights into how to talk about uh, this this trend towards Christian nationalism again today. There are a lot of parallels. Um, Christian nationalism was part of how this tragedy in human history came to be. Um, there already was a state church, as is the case in many countries in Europe still today. Uh, but in this case, the church and the state became conflated, combined, overlapping in unhealthy ways. And so uh, to avoid the mistakes and tragedies and injustices of the past, I'm doing this series to talk about how we can learn from them and look at the situation now. Uh, this week, I'll just be looking at one chapter, um, and that chapter is called Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Hitler's Persecution of the Jews talk a little bit about Bonhoeffer. I've actually done a series on him before, earlier this year, uh, a Lutheran pastor and teacher and writer, um, often lifted up as as a more contemporary um, example of faith, and, and a lot of his teachings are still lifted up high in seminary and in churches and, and in personal people's personal lives as they um, look to saints before to uh, inspire them in their faith today. Uh, the next two chapters look at the Catholic Church in Germany at the time, so I'll do those two together next time. Uh, we've been pretty much in the Protestant sphere up until now. So let me grab my notes here. Here's how I'm going to approach this week. I'm going to start with one of Luther's teachings. It's called The Teaching of Two Kingdoms. Um, it's, it's one of the more well-known kind of Lutheran, uh, what would you call it, Lutheran teachings, you know, Lutheran hallmarks that are out there, but it's more on the academic side, maybe. It, it hasn't really always made its way into normal congregational life or sermons as much, at least not in recent history, but uh, it was something that was brought up a lot by German Lutheran pastors and seminary professors and bishops and teachers and during the era that I've been talking about in, in uh, as I said, in the 30s and 40s in Germany. Um, so first, just a real basic primer on what Two Kingdoms teaching is. This is from Dr. Craig Nesson, who was uh, one of my professors in seminary at Wartburg Theological Seminary in Dubuque, Iowa. Um, most of what Craig says or writes is is worth paying attention to. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons my handwriting is as bad as it is now, is just trying to keep up with the wisdom that came from that man's mouth. <laughs> trying to keep up uh, writing notes and writing it down. Um, here we go. Uh, Luther understood God to be engaged in fierce competition with Satan for control over the world. In this contest, God employs two distinct strategies, a left-hand strategy of temporal governance and a right-hand strategy of spiritual governance. Traditionally, these two strategies have been referred to as the two kingdoms, 
uh, Dr. Nesson would say strategies or the two reigns or something like that. In the left-hand strategy, God seeks to provide good and just order in the world through government, labor, and family life. The institutional facet of the church would be included in that as well. Um, in, in this strategy, God works through the structures of the world. In the right-hand strategy, God works through the theological use of the law, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the freedom of the gospel. The gospel sets us free from sin, death, and the power of Satan, and free for serving the needs of the neighbor. So that spiritual conviction of the law that drives us to our knees to seek God's mercy, and then the freeing power of the gospel that, that forgives our sins, opens us up to eternal life, and changes how we live now so that it's freed from, freed for. Okay. Uh, Christians participate in both of these strategies. When we examine our lives in light of God's law, we are convicted of our sin. The recognition of our failure to measure up to God's will leads us to repentance and prepares us to receive the gospel. I guess I should have just kept reading. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is received as pure gift, grace. Um, it comes to us through the proclaimed word of a sermon, the story of Christ shared by a Christian, or in the visible words of the sacraments. Jesus Christ comes alive as we hear the gospel, and we trust in his grace. The gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to set us free from everything that holds us in bondage and free for paying attention to the needs of others. The gospel of Jesus Christ sets Christians free to engage both in God's left-hand strategy by caring for needs of others in all God's world through social ministry and in God's right-hand strategy by sharing the good news of what Christ has done through our evangelizing. God is ambidextrous. God needs Christians and congregations to hold social ministry and evangelism together as they participate in God's mission. The two kingdoms teaching of Luther has been misinterpreted in many destructive ways, often to justify Christian quietism and complacency. That is where uh, things went awry in Germany in the 30s and 40s. Um, sort of the standard teaching in both the German Christian movement, which was that sort of movement within the German Protestant church called the German Christian um, that that was very pro-Hitler, thinking it was a return to law and order, uh, getting back to the traditional values of Germans in Germany, a, a Volkskirche, the, the church that was specifically for the German people or folk, um, but actually within the confessing church as well, which had a pushback against the German Christian movement that said, no, the church needs to stay the church and we shouldn't be taking this Aryan paragraph into church constitutions that expelled any Jews, Jewish Christians or Christians of Jewish descent out of positions of leadership. Um, state, stay, state, church, stays church. So that was, even within the confessing church, that separation of church and state was good. However, when it came to the persecution of the Jews, the expulsion of the Jews, the concentration camps, up to a certain point, the even the confessing church still said, oh, well, you know, it is within the state's power to do what they want, so we're going to let the state do the state, and the church will do the church. And so they, there was that, that misinterpretation of the two kingdoms teaching of Luther to say, well, the church will do the church thing, the state will do the state thing, as opposed to speaking out against the injustice and actively working on behalf of the Jewish people uh, or others who are being euthanized or thrown into con concentration camps um and uh speaking working actively against so supporting the jews but also working against the state when it crossed that line uh, so separation of church and state or sorry excuse me the two kingdoms teaching instead of being shown used as a way of showing how god is in control god is ambidextrous god is working through these two different strategies and reigns and kingdoms uh and that we need to participate in both um, in the left hand strategy, including as citizens and uh, pushing back against the government when it goes too far. Um, yeah, lost my train of thought there for a second. But we need to participate in both that and in the church in terms of word sacrament. There we go, back on track. Um, so when used well, Two Kingdoms teaching shows how God is, how God reigns, how God participates and guides and interacts with and influences our world, both through spiritual side 
hearts, our conscience, but also through things like governments and states and institutions. Um, if Christian nationalism, so think of Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism conflates, we've talked about in previous sessions, it, it takes state and church and, and combines them in ways that damage and distort both the church and the state. It makes this, the church take such a narrow interpretation of scripture and tradition that it, it is really not being true to the gospel of Christ. It takes the state and morphs it into like this, you know, what, what our country's founding folks and the pilgrims are trying to get away from, where there's this sort of undue influence of the, of the church over the state. So it's not really a democratic thing. Um, so that's, that's the danger of Christian nationalism. Um, the other extreme, then, besides just this healthy separation of church and state, the other extreme would be where the state is so contrary to the gospel, such as what the Nazi regime was doing, um, that when obedience to government using two kingdoms as your justification, well, the state does what the state does, and that's not our problem, um, that ends up amounting to disobedience to Christ. Um, then you no longer just have a healthy separation of church and state. Then you move into what Dr. Nesson talked about in terms of quietism and complacency. Um, the church must openly repudiate and resist the state if the state does things and operates in ways that are contrary to the gospel. So on the one extreme, you have the total combination of church and state, which is Christian nationalism, which is a danger, which we've seen in the previous sessions uh, among the, the German Christian side. Um, and then the other problem would be the quietism and complacency that was expressed pretty much consistently by the confessing church, which were supposed to be the good guys, quote unquote. Um, they hit, kind of hid behind this two kingdoms teaching of Luther to say, well, the state does what the state does and the church does what the church does. And when the state is doing what the state was doing there in Nazi Germany, then you can't do that. Um, in that respect, you need to exercise your vocation as a citizen with the undergirding of the gospel of Christ, which includes calls for justice, which includes uh, protecting the vulnerable. Very clear in both the gospels and the Old Testament prophets. Um, if you're not doing that, then you've gone too far in the other direction. So you don't want to conflate church and state, but you also don't want to separate them so much that atrocities are committed. And you just sit back and say, well, that's not my sphere. Um, talk a little bit more in general, and then we'll come to um, a little bit on the Bonhoeffer chapter. It was, it was more biographical than anything else. I don't have a lot to say from the chapter this week, but a little. Let me bring up one other kind of thing coming from our local neighborhood. Uh, a lot of times as I'm driving around, I go past the signs on the campuses for what was formerly called John Tyler University, a community college in the neighborhood, a lot of, or in the neighborhood, in the area, a lot of kids go there to get their requirements done or pick up their associate's degree. Uh, sometimes that's, you know, they get what they need, they move into the workforce, sometimes they use those two years as a stepping stone to some other four-year institution to finish up a degree. Um, respected institution around here. Uh, you may have noticed or read in the news that they recently changed their name to Bright Point University. Um, and the reason being, uh, if you didn't see the press releases, is because John Tyler was a slave owner. Yes, he was the president of the United States, but he was also a slave owner. Uh, some of the other buildings and streets on campus were also renamed because they were either also slave owners from that period of time, or were very much against desegregation of schools and, and publicly, vehemently, were against desegregation um, during the Civil Rights era. And so the college said, you know, we don't have to forget these people, these figures, and the contributions they made to our history, but we also don't need to lift up and honor these folks that have a troubling place in our nation's history and legacy by naming colleges and buildings and streets after them. This is partly also what was going on with the Monument Avenue situation. Some folks said, well, we're erasing history. And well, 
we can still learn the history. We can still know their names and what they did and the part they played and, and the good things, uh, if any. <laughs> but we also don't just gloss over the troubling parts. And we still have a Jefferson Memorial. We still have a Washington Memorial. You know, many folks have pointed out, too, that if you go to Mount Vernon or Monticello now, um, that you also learn about the, the entirety of their legacy, that they were slave owners. And here's the thing. Lutherans are all about both and. We have the left hand and the right hand strategy. We've got, we are simultaneously sinners and saints, both and. Uh, God works through both the law and the gospel. Lutherans are good with, with complexity. Lutherans are good with the gray and between the black and white. We're good with both and. And so you can have both with Jefferson and, and Washington in particular, that they were founding fathers, that they championed liberty that they helped write the Constitution and create this great country that we live in, including in the Bill of Rights, the separation of church and state. They knew that was a good idea. Um, and at the same time, we can discuss and, and recognize that they were flawed individuals and that they did own slaves and that they did avoid policies that could have changed that or supported policies that kept things the way they were. We can have these two things side by side. It doesn't have to be one or the other. We can look at the whole complex picture and say, well, some of our founding fathers are, are heroes, are great, greatly and should be lifted up, learned from, and at the same time, <laughs> recognize their flaws, their failings, and the parts of the legacy that we don't lift up and move forward. Same thing applies to Martin Luther. He had wonderful teachings like Two Kingdoms. Um, all these wonderful things. His earlier writings about Jewish people talked about how they are the inheritors of God's promise, the chosen people. We, you know, as Christians, we we respect them. After they rejected his pitch to convert to Christianity, then he wrote these horrible polemics and, and screeds against them, calling for the synagogues to be burned and, and for them to suffer the just punishment for rejecting Christ. 1938, I think, 39, you get Kristallnacht, um, where the synagogues were burned, where the streets were full of broken glass. And a lot of the folks and the buildup in the church said, yeah, well, Luther said we should act this way towards the Jews. So at the same time, we have Luther, who we're named after, who wrote all this amazing things about God's grace and, and, and changed the game, changed how we talk about it. I love Martin Luther. I love his writings, Freedom of a Christian. Law and Gospel, how to use scripture. He translated the Bible into German. He changed everything, kicked off the Reformation. And at the same time, I can hear here the Lutheran World Federation for issuing apologies and recantations in the past 10, 20 years on those things that, Jesus, that Luther wrote about the Jews and other things that have been part of a, a troubling part of Lutheran legacy that were used to justify atrocities like the Holocaust, that were um, you know, that weren't in keeping with the gospel of Christ. At no point did Jesus call for, he may have called, he may have talked about bringing a sword and division among families. He may have talked about the weeping and gnashing of teeth for those who rejected the kingdom of God. But at no point did Jesus ever say, hey, that group over there, those Pharisees, those Sadducees, those those Gentiles, those Romans, burn them down. That is not how the New Testament goes. That is not how the Gospels go. So I guess my word of the day, or one of my words of the day, is objectivity. In the Christian national Frankenstein monster, Frankenstein's monster, that is Christian nationalism, you lose objectivity. I talked the other week about Israel's namesake meaning to wrestle with God, to strive with God. We're, we're called to wrestle with these things, and not just scripture or our faith, but also our vocations in the world in which we live, including that left-hand kingdom of the state of government. We need to be objective, both towards the government, so that we can assess if they are doing things that are contrary to the gospel, and thereby, and therefore requiring us as Christians to step up and call out against that, work to change that. But we also need to be objective about ourselves and our church. If we are straying off the path, if we're being complacent, too quiet about things, 
if we're getting overly involved, if we're contributing to that church state Frankenstein monster, objectivity is the word of the day here. And so if you see folks talking about Christian nationalism, if, if then others, supporters, supporters, constituents, ask them questions, trying to get a sense of what they mean when they say that, apply some objectivity here. If those answers feel like a dodge, if they feel like a narrow interpretation of scripture, be objective. Put aside party politics, whether it's left or right. There's Christian right and a Christian left, progressives and conservatives. If it feels like it's pushing things together too much and not being objective, be aware of that, be objective about it, call it out. Um, read my notes here. Oh, yeah, well, Christian nationalism, as I mentioned, combines and sacrifices the best of both, both the nation and the church. And that's where you get things like Christian flags at the January 6th attacks. That's where you get Christian flags and symbols at the Charlottesville rally led to the death of that person being hit with the car. And that's how you lead to the cover of this book. This is a high salute being done. So you get to some of the other stories I've shared in weeks past in here, um, incorporating the Aryan paragraph, all of those conflations. Okay. It's not good. To be objective so that we don't go down this road again. Just a little bit about Bonhoeffer in here. Bonhoeffer had a an interesting background. He grew up in a well-off scientific household. His family he had seven, I think, siblings. His family um, was fine with the Weimar Republic, that little brief interlude of, of Democratic Republic in between the, the Kaiser and the Nazi regime. Um, he had both a good friend and a brother-in-law who were Christian Jews. And so um, his, his writing and his speaking changed over the course of time uh, to be, uh, well, I'll just read you the summary. Bonhoeffer's theology, like his short life, had its twists and turns. In a decade's time, he passed through three distinct stages. His call to obedience to the state that nonetheless preserved the integrity and autonomy of the church. So that sort of complacency quietism thing going along with the confessing church. Um, his call to suffering for the cause of justice and truth. So stand with the Christian Jews. It was always Christian Jews for a while. Didn't quite go to just Jews in general. And then at the end, at last, his call to resistance and active participation in the life of the world, to the point of him becoming involved in a plot, an assassination plot against Hitler. In comparison, Bonhoeffer's confessing church did not get past the first stage. The German Protestant church failed to protect its own turf, much less did it take a united stand on behalf of Jews or other victims of Nazi persecution, even less did it resist the state. For those who came to Bonhoeffer through a study of the German church struggle, adulation might indeed seem the appropriate response to his life. However, those who arrive at Bonhoeffer from a study of the Holocaust most likely have a different view, one that describes Bonhoeffer's ideas as part of the problem rather than part of the solution, at least at the beginning. Truly, in the shadow of the Holocaust, Bonhoeffer's words and actions appear small, tentative, restrained, and ambivalent, and he himself struggled with how he should react, fleeing to London, going to America, coming back, do I run away, do I stay and suffer alongside the people in Germany, okay? Um... Yet his life was like a small candle in the black hole of his time. The Bonhoeffer phenomenon, the public reception of this man, illustrates that people would rather huddle around one point of light, no matter how feeble and flickering the flame, than sit alone in darkness. That's kind of their last word on Bonhoeffer. Um, two other quotes to share. Um, 22, page 122 is... There... Um, towards his later writing, Bonhoeffer emphasized the costly, the radical, the dangerous side of Christian discipleship, not an acquiescent, easy, guarded, and safe Christian life. Okay. You want to avoid Christian nationalism, but you also don't want to go so far as to become quiet and complacent in the face of a government that has become contrary to the gospel. Um, and so... He called out that cost of discipleship. It's even the name of one of his writings. The other quote to share is right here. 
one twenty six. Uh, this is something that Bonhoeffer uh, wrote as he was looking back on his earlier writings. I am guilty of cowardly silence at a time when I ought to have spoken. I am guilty of hypocrisy and untruthfulness in the face of force. I have been lacking in compassion, and I have denied the poorest of my brethren. He saved his sharpest words, however, for his indictment of the Church. The Church confesses that she has witnessed the lawless application of brutal force, the physical and spiritual suffering of countless innocent people, oppression, hatred, and murder, and that she has not raised her voice on behalf of the victims and has not found ways to hasten to their aid. She is guilty of the deaths of the weakest and most defenseless brothers of Jesus Christ. Bonhoeffer's use of the phrase brothers of Jesus Christ indicates that he spoke here of the suffering and murder of Jews a year before uh, a conference that sanctioned such brutality as official policy. Elsewhere in his book Ethics, however, he broadened his scope by denouncing euthanasia of the physically and mentally ill and So even though he wavered back and forth, I think his kind of journey and progression and evolution kind of highlights um, sort of what the Christian movement often is in the face of a tyrannical or an contrary to the gospel government. At first you're like, oh no, it's not our place. It's not that bad. And then as time goes on, you say, well, you know, we need to help these victims. This isn't right. And then eventually, through history, it's usually shown that Christians will eventually stand up and not only say, well, this isn't right, or not only stand with victims, but push back against uh, something that is that far contrary to the gospel, but engage in active resistance. My hope is that as this theme and thread of Christian nationalism um, is putting itself out there, if it becomes stronger, if it leads to more things like Charlottesville or January 6th, uh, putting pulling in the current version of racism that also includes anti-Semitism, um, that we move through these stages that Bonhoeffer moved through more quickly and more decisively than has happened in the past to cut this monster's head off before it gets where it did in the past. Um, my words of the day are objectivity, discernment, and courage. Okay? Last thing. I uh, recently read an article from the Associated Press by Peter Smith and Deepa Bharath. This was from May 29th of this year. It's called Christian Nationalism on the Rise in Some GOP Campaigns. So yes, they are signaling out that, but those are the ones that have been the most vocal about it. I'm going to particularly talk about Doug Mastriano in Pennsylvania. Again, I'm not trying to be partisan here, just reading an article, okay? I, I, <laughs> I realize I'll probably be getting some emails about this, but I'm just lifting this up as one example. I am sure that there are others who would look at more progressive branches of the Christian church and those who are calling for more uh, legislation when it comes to LGBTQ matters or things like that and, and lift those up as well, okay? Disclaimer. Here's what it says. Mastriano is a unique case where he really does in his speeches highlight this apocalyptic idea where his supporters and causes are on God's side, says Andrew Whitehead, sociology professor at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, and co-author of Taking America Back for God, Christian Nationalism in the United States. It literally is good and evil, he continued. There's no room for compromise, so that is the threat to democracy. Again, objectivity. Don't narrow the, the description. If it's boiled down to only good and evil, then you're probably missing, probably missing something. Robert Jones, CEO of the Public Religion Research Institute, said that the January 6th displays of Christian flags and other Christian messaging symbols were not surprising. According to a recent survey by the Institute, white evangelical Christians were among the strongest supporters of the assertion that God intended America as a, quote, promised land for European Christians. Uh, those who backed that idea were far more likely to agree that true American patriots may have to resort to violence to save our country. Again, this is not what Jesus taught. Elizabeth Newman, chief strategy officer for Moonshot, a tech company that aims to counter online violent extremism, disinformation, and other harms, said Christian nationalism began picking up steam around 2015 amid a rising narrative of purported persecution of Christians. Newman, who served in the George W. Bush and Trump administrations and grew up in an evangelical Christian household, called the movement, quote, heretical and idolatry and an apocalyptic vision that very often leads to violence. Many pastors are pushing back against it, she added. I see Christian nationalism as the gasping, dying breath of the older generation in America that is afraid that Christians are going to be replaced, she said. 
objectivity, objectivity, discernment, compassion, courage. Um, just be on the lookout. Turn back to the Gospels. Read Jesus. Read Paul. Read what's actually there. Read it in its entirety. Struggle with it. Wrestle with it. And know that it's not like a light switch moment. Bonhoeffer went through a lot, even in the midst of what was going on in Germany, uh, before he got to where he ended up getting. Um, and um, so just know that. And again, I lifted up this one example from the Associated Press, but know that it's out there. All of us are prone to picking and choosing and and just grabbing onto the parts of scripture and our, our theological heritage that, that appeal to us and fit what we already think. Encouraging y'all, especially when you hear the stuff about Christian nationalism, to step outside your comfort zone, to wrestle and strive with these things, and uh, to resist these things publicly. Call them out and say, that is not what Christianity means to me. That is not what Jesus taught. Let's have a conversation. That's the challenge. That's the uphill battle. My prayers are with all of us as we struggle with this, this trend and this strain, and as we learn from history, and as we move into a future together, following Jesus and working to have God's kingdom come about in and through us. Thanks for your time, and uh, next week we'll cover the Catholic side of things in the church and see what that has been. Catholic side of things in Germany, 30s and 40s, and see what that has to teach us for today. Peace be with you.